What is it about Star Citizen that people love? I'm Old Man Johnny Morgan, and in today's episode, we're going to spend a little bit of time examining the question, what is the pain point that Chris Roberts really hit on and CIG solved? What is it that's been driving gamers into this project year over year in ever greater numbers and continuously breaking each year's record year over year for fundraising? What is it that really attracts us to it? What is the pain in the industry that is making gamers turn around, look at CIG and Star Citizen, even with the state of the game it is? Like, it can't just be the game. The game is amazing, but it's in an unfinished state. It's very early days still, even though it's been around for 10 years. So what is it? What is this pain point that they saw? I've really wanted to take a look at this for a while. It's something that's, you know, I found really interesting on a personal level. You know, my relationship with Chris Roberts is like many others. And before we dive into, you know, the topic of what is the pain point that they solved, let's go, I'm going to take it down memory lane a little bit, and we're going to take a look at gaming history a little bit here. Now, my relationship with Chris Roberts started like many others in 1990 with the, with the release of Wing Commander. Absolutely adored the game. You know, it was incredible. Cinematic cutscenes, it had this narrative built into it, yet the combat was intense. It was skill-based. There was no push button to win, right? Like, you had to get good at the game to be successful and win. I played it over and over. You know, scum saved when people I lost that I didn't want to. 1991, Wing Commander 2 dropped. That's really short. Like, remember how fast these things came out, too. Even better game, right? Wing Commander 2 was my go-to. That was the one I absolutely adored by it. Wing Commander 1 is the OG, but number 2 was the one that I played to death. It was much more in-depth, much bigger game. Absolutely loved it. Now, there's a big gap for me next on the Chris Roberts games that I played. Like, I, Wing Commander 3, when it dropped, I don't think I had the CD-ROM or the specs of the system to run it. Um, so I didn't actually get to play it at the time. I remember wanting to because Mark Hamill was in it. And I was like, oh, wow, this looks really neat, right? And he continued on. It is fantastic. I eventually got around to it. At the but it was Privateer 2 The Darkening in 1996 was the next one that I really grabbed. I had the system for it. I really missed the Wing Commander series. I hadn't played anything really like it since then. Uh, and then there was this big, much more richer, deeper story in it. And he introduced me to Clive Owen. Now, when I played the game, I didn't know who Clive Owen was. I didn't know he was a real actor. But the output from that, and I always thought this was really neat, and it really cemented Chris Roberts in my mind, is that by introducing me to Clive Owen, later on when I was flipping through TV, uh, I saw the actor from Privateer 2 in a movie. And I was like, what? And it was right at the very beginning of it, so I stopped and watched it. And the movie is called Bent, and it is an absolutely fantastic and amazing movie. I highly recommend it. Give it a watch if you haven't seen it. It's on the older side now, but... The topic is amazing and you should give it a go. I learned stuff from it. It was incredible. And so Chris Roberts is indirectly responsible for me taking the time and learning that. It was always a neat little sticking point for me. Um, and it was something I brought out through the years when people brought up and like, you know, hacked on gaming. I'm like, well, this happened, right? It, there is value here. Um, so maybe not necessarily entertainment that you, you recognize, but it is different and our relationship with them are different. More time passes. Now, there's a big gap here for uh, Space Sims for me. The next big one that came out was Microsoft Allegiance in 2000 for me. I played that game to death. It was absolutely amazing at the time. Its tagline to this day is still the best Space Sim that nobody played. And while it had a really strong, really loyal fan base, like incredibly loyal, we kept it going long after the game was dead. We even bugged Microsoft so much that they eventually released, released the source code for it. Uh, so that they could code and continue on the development. They upgraded it from DirectX 6 to DirectX 8 over time and added more factions and increased the server cap and improved performance and fixed bugs. It was really amazing, right? Um, it's on Steam now, actually, and you can you can check it out. It's long past its heyday. But what killed Allegiance wasn't the technology. It wasn't the game design. You know, there it had very few flaws for its time period. There were some critical bugs and stuff that, you know, you could crash people's clients through and stuff like that, which sucked and eventually got patched out. What killed it was what happened in 1999. Another game was released in 1999 that changed the gaming industry and how business models for games were developed. And that was EverQuest, right? Sony dropped this huge game that made an insanely sick amount of money per month. It had a uh, monthly recurring revenue. So MMR was there and now on the table. Well, gaming, you know, there was other ones that were subscription based before that, but not like EverQuest, right? It blew up and then Blizzard and set the stage for WoW and Blizzard, which then cemented the subscription model as, you know, the go-to model for gaming. 
it did allow you to do bigger projects and they were much more deeper and involved and continue on those worlds, right? So there wasn't a very strong incentive from the communities, the consumer, to have that relationship with the, the game developer, right? There was really hopeful initially with EverQuest and but then it went sour really fast and we realized that, you know, while they took our money monthly, they didn't really have to listen to us. And they didn't. That's what happened to Allegiance. Microsoft tried to shoehorn a subscription model into it, and what they gave us initially for free, then they put up a paywall, and there's some, you know, game-breaking bugs in the sense that you could crash other people's clients and destroy a whole, you know, whole server, so why play a 200-person game if someone could kill it? The free version that they had limited, I think, to 24 players, so games were like 12 versus 12, which wasn't big enough for this game. You really needed the 64 versus, you know, 32 versus 32 to really lean in and have, like, the really rich games that we were having, so... Over time, it, the community just went right, right off a cliff, and then they canceled it. They didn't have a good relationship with it to begin with. Microsoft wasn't very invested in it. It was the first game that really, you know, I recognized that the industry was kind of a shit show to work in. The lead developer, Solap, who made this amazing game, and the game design was incredible. PvP, uh, you know, skill-based PvP only. There was no AI in it. We had a tech tree. It was randomized. Um, so there was high replayability. It was just great. Um, it was amazing. It was a business model field. And he left to go do Palm OS apps, I believe. Right? That was shocking to me at the time. We're almost on memory lane here. Now, the next big game for Chris Roberts pops up, and it's a space game. So I've had a dry period. There's no allegiance anymore. There's nothing else. I was playing World War II online after that. So I was still looking for that competitive skills based game, you know, based in a simulation type environment. Where my my skills mattered, not some pushing button thing. I played WoW for a little bit, but it turned out really quite quickly because I didn't enjoy that. There is skill in WoW, don't get me wrong, but it's just not the same type that I was looking for, and that you know really pushes my gaming buttons. Freelancer and Starlancer come on the horizon, and it's all the things that I'm looking for, you know, in an MMO and in this big multi-universe world, but it's going to be able to self-hosted, right? And Oh, it looked like so great. You know, firing up the old buds from Allegiance, right? We're getting all hype for it. And then Chris quits or gets fired. And they put out this very, you know, skeleton framework of what we were promised. And this point and click game that didn't feel like a space sim at all. It was, it was just such an empty shell of what could have been there. Well, that's, you know, for me, that's the memory lane that I'm going to take us to. And obviously, there's Star Citizen on this memory lane. But that's, for me, where the dream died for video games, right? That was where I was like, okay, this... Also, a couple of years later, I had an autistic kid, and I, I mostly played uh, single-player games. I got, became an indie gamer because their relationship, the relationship that I had with the developers and the game and the product itself, right? The producers of that platform, whatever it was, was much more intimate much more focused on the player, listen to feedback. So things like Don't Starve, right? The Kia and all these other indie games I got into, Telltale games. I love the Walking Dead series, right? Played that to death. Uh, Left 4 Dead 2 was another one that filled the gap because it was such a good cooperative game plan. I love the multiplayer too, and I love working together. But Starlancer Freelancer burned me hard, and I never really got invested into projects again like I did in that one. And I was really mad at Chris. Like, I, I was pissed. I thought he just quit. Like, I thought he just gave up because it was too hard or something. I didn't really understand. And I was wrong. Like, in hindsight, I'm pretty sure I was damn wrong on that. I understand a bit better now. Um, as I've grown, my career has grown, and I, I, you know, I've been at sea level, and I understand the other side of it now. And what kind of happened to him most likely did happen there. And during that time period, the, the, the business models of gaming has changed, you know, radically. And how they're financed and the ROI attached and the return on investment, which has ultimately, in a lot of our opinions and mine for sure, ruined gaming in a lot of ways. Right? We do not get the things we're promised. We get things that are pushed out way ahead of time than they should be because the people that finance it wants their, want and have to have the return on that investment. Cyberpunk's a great example of that. It should have baked for another couple of years and they would have made probably a 100x return on it compared to what they made now. Way more. Way, way more. We could have built a whole ecosystem around it. Not given the chance. The, the people that you know created that value proposition, created that game, designed it all, they weren't really in charge of it. And they're not. They just work for it, right? They were ended up working for their own dream. Being employees of their own dream and vision. 
Chris went through that with freelancing and Starlancer. I understand that now. This happens to a ton of founders and startups. It's not even specific to gaming. It's all over the place. And it's really disappointing. This is why you want to keep and hold your equity to your chest for as long as you can and build as much value as you can on the books with sales because it's a formula when that happens. There's no interpretation. It's a hard written formula that your valuation is this. And then if you go and shop and sell some of your equity, you don't lose control. And that's the pain point that I believe CIG has ultimately solved here and hit on. Right? They accidentally stumbled onto a farm to table type business model for delivering a high quality gaming platform. Like this cloud-based platform, which started as Chris just, you know, you can pretty clearly tell from the initial pitch that it was a, it was be able to finish the freelancer Star Lancer. And I love his business model. I think he's a genius for this in hindsight. At the time, I thought it was really smart too. And even now, I think it is, is being able and addressing the fact that a huge chunk of the gaming industry and market, like 70 odd percent of it, is single player. They don't, they don't play multiplayer games. So if he builds just for multiplayer, he's losing out a huge chunk of revenue and potential customers that he can guide through the journey from single player into multiplayer and then even potentially into the hardcore pvp side right and there's you know 25 percentage 24 percentage there's somewhere around there for multiplayer and then it's like four or five percent in the pvp only like people that play warzone and stuff like that only every day all the time just do that so that's kind of how the demographics work and chris was really smart with that freelancer star lancer was, was it when i saw the kickstarter i didn't i didn't back it I wasn't into backing it at all. I thought it was going to flop, right? I thought Chris was going to quit again. I didn't understand the things I under understand now. It's pretty amazing that he kept alive. And I'd like to actually address to someone else here, and that's Sandy. Sandy's been with him for, like, all of this stuff. So she kept the dream alive, too. The two of them and the small little group. You know, Tony is definitely there and others. That kept the dream alive after being burned so hard on something that is just like insanely rare what chris has done here is to keep that original vision alive keep pursuing it keep going forward and then figure out a way to go directly to the market consumer and say hey i i've been pitching this around for ages right no one who who will finance this will give me a dollar for it they're not willing to do it because they know and i know too it's going to take way longer than we really want it to so I'm going to come to you, the consumers, and I'm the producer, and this is the vision. And now if you want to go farther, I'm willing it to do it too there, boys. We just went, let's go! Well, not me. I wasn't there. I was skeptical, right? I rejected it. But you guys did. And I fucking love you for that so much because I was wrong. I was wrong. Chris didn't quit. He got burned. He got burned real hard. And he kept going. You gotta love the man for that. You gotta love everyone that backed him. And continued on with him. Including all the players. All the consumers that said, you know what, man? I will give you some of my value. For time. You'll give me a JPEG. That's cool. Whatever. We can laugh about it later. I'll give you time. You take that time that I'm giving you. And everyone else. And you apply it to this project. And you continue to li listen to us and continue to include us in the franchise. And I think ultimately that was the pain point that they solved. It's the financing of how do you build games. Without getting stuck with a two to five year ROI. And continuously having to shop around for bridge loans and all this other stuff to keep the fundraising going. Why not go directly to the, the consumer and cut out all these middlemen? disintermediate the production of video games. Boss freaking move. Absolutely a boss move. And we saw it and we backed it. Now we went overboard. Like you guys went so overboard. Not me. I didn't back it here. I'm still skeptical. So overboard. I was skeptical. Man, was I wrong. So it was around like 2016 or so. I don't know, autistic kid, I'm pretty open about that. So I miss a good chunk of this stuff. Anyway, the game industry massively changed during it. Um, and then by the time we got back into it and started looking around at it and being like, wow, this thing is actually going. Chris isn't quitting. Oh, right. He's still pursuing this dream. And now he has a relationship where it looks like he 
he can actually execute on this without being forced, without his hand being forced. Now let's see if he can get disciplined about it. And he has. I know we miss him. He stepped back from the community. But it's the right thing to do. At this stage of the development, it's the right leadership move to do. Him and Sandy have done a really great job. Todd Pappy, John Tracy, a whole bunch of the other ones. Every single person that works at CIG that picked up the vision and carried this torch for us. We are backing you. 100%. And it was the community that pulled me in. I've been very vocal about that. I've always been upfront about it. Salty Mike, Meyer, Dark Law, Space Cutlet, Moist Noodle. Uh, Anna, I'm a huge fan of too. There's a ton of other ones now. Gabs, etc. Burks, uh, Avenger One. Uh, zero state, right? We're going to keep on going. And all the background players, all the small guys, all of you and girls, ladies, and everyone in between, right? you know, whatever you identify as, all love you. It's an amazing community and it pulled me in and it showed me that there's a narrative to build in here. So many narratives and we can do them on the fly. We can plan them out. We can put some, a little bit of effort in, a lot of effort. We can design whatever we want and we're going to have at some point soon, all of us together in the same damn verse. Now, I know we're getting three shards to begin with. That's a technical limitation. Layer one, layer two stuff outside of their control. They're going to do the best job they can. We'll continue to move forward. If 20 years from now, it's going to be a different ball game. And yeah. Yeah, I want to play Star Citizen in my 60s. 20 years from now. Hell yeah. We have people who right now who are 60 to play it. I want this relationship to keep going. I think that they have really hit the nail on the head with the requirement to build a platform directly around the producer and consumer interacting on it, the development. Now, I hope they continue to innovate in this and that they continue to include us in the franchise and figure out new ways to reward those that put the time in, hashtag do the work, hashtag put the time in, and provide real value to the network itself, to the entire ecosystem, and that they lean in to this, this platform more and figure out ways to keep us involved. Our contributions matter. It may not seem like it at times, but I know in my heart CIG really appreciates it. That we give them the time and space to really deliver on a product that has never been delivered before in the history of gaming. We did something unique here and I'm really glad I joined it when I did. I got in like tail end of 2018 and I've had a blast. I've had an absolutely amazing time in this game. I, I love it. It's ruined me for all others, just like everyone else. I'm along the path. I've gotten my VKB from my right. I'm still using my T16 for the left. There's no need to really, really super upgrade because I'm not super sweaty hardcore, but I've gotten way better at PvP. I'm not top drawer. But I got some skills. Old man Johnny's not, he, he's not, not a noob anymore. That's for sure. And that's part of the fun of this game. A truly skills-based game is an absolute joy because you can continue to get better at it. 1% more each day. Avenger 1. It's a good quote. He's a good guy. He cares a lot too. Like everyone else. Like Mike. Like Meyer. Like all of our content creators. All the ones over on YouTube. All the ones that just exist in game and do events. All the org leaders. They all really care. And we really care about this game. Because there is nothing else like it. There is no one else that is presenting this type of relationship that we can have with the developer, publisher, and distribution. Right? Like, we, we, it's all the same person. And that's scary at times, for sure. It's all new ground that we're in. This is unique. And there is legit nothing on their horizon. And everyone knows it. You look at Doc, you look at Lupo, you hear it with Timmy, you hear it with Cotton, you hear it with Deadly, Deadly Slob, and... Uh, Pep are hanging out here again, right? They've always been popping in and out and been keeping an eye on it. They're all looking for something that can really let them build their stories and narratives that can bring their communities along for that ride. Get them right involved and have the ones that really, you know, hashtag put the time in, hashtag you know, do the work, be involved and be these extras and minor characters and maybe some of them pop up to larger characters as they go along and they get these deeper storylines going or they just have these really great events like what i'm focused on i love doing the pvp events i love doing tourneys it's super fun i just do the house league style stuff right now there's so much stuff to do in it and then doing these mixed fights and stuff and having these big space battles ah like i'm looking forward to the first thousand thousand player battle no one else is going to give it to us, man. We all know it. 
CIG's it. Well, there is one more player that's entered the market. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll see what happens with that, though. I got faith. I think he can. I think he can be another good person in the ecosystem. We need more. CIG, you've done a real good thing here, Chris, Sandy. I am really sorry for doubting you, man. I didn't understand. I think I do now. Could be wrong. Maybe you screwed the pooch. <laughs> I'm sure you've been hard on yourself in some of those years. But you've done an amazing job here. And just keep it going, bro. Keep us involved. Keep innovating in that space. Keep thinking about how you can include us in the franchise. The ships are a good way. But there, there's probably others. And getting that on the roadmap, thinking in the 5 to 10 year span. Soon. Not yet. But you're close. That's when we wrap it up here. My conclusion on this is the reason why CIG has done so well is not the game, Star Citizen. It's not Squadron 42. It is the fact that they have a very personalized relationship with their consumers. And the consumers really love the platform. They, they love it so much that one of the voice actors, and I reference Anna, right? They pulled her into the game. That's why she plays and continuously has a community around this. And they, they're backing one of the people that we love. And we back so many of them, right? Incredible. And gamers see it more and more. They're coming in, and we're going to see a lot more as it comes along. When we hit that beta stride and they get to start putting content in, ooh, doggy, baby, baby, baby. There's lots of us here waiting for you we got a real warm welcome for you coming. And whatever you want to do, you'll find a home here. And you'll find other people that will do it with you. <laughs> all right, peeps. Old man Johnny Morgan signing off here. I absolutely adore and love you all. And I will see you in the verse. <laughs>